This week on Motor Week, a multitasker's Ginny Buckley and Richard Hammond take a look at three small cars, the Peugeot 306, the Ford Focus, and the Vauxhall Astra Sport. Also this week, Chris Goffey drives the Mazda 626, and Richard Hammond takes a look at the new Frontiero V6. The small car category is used by manufacturers to group together the cars that you and I are most likely to buy. And these three, the Ford Focus, the Vauxhall Astra, and the Peugeot 306, fit that category quite nicely. In their history, some shorter than others, they boast accolades such as best handling car, best small car, the list goes on. But which is really the best? And as they all have a similar price tag, which one would you actually buy? Well, we've gathered them all together today to take a look in depth and give you our impressions. Back in the early 90s, with the VW Golf getting bigger, more luxurious and softer in its responses, the Peugeot 306 stepped forward as the class benchmark for ride and handling. On the road, the car feels very compact. It actually feels smaller than the other two. It does have a very, very slick gearbox, which makes for smooth driving. And technical types will tell you that the rear suspension has been specially designed to turn in. Well, that actually means it's a lot of fun through the corners. And that's the main word here, fun. It's a very fun car to drive. But it's never going to set the world on fire aesthetically. I'm not saying it's an ugly car, far from it, but it is a bit bland and starting to look a bit dated. I can still see echoes of the shape of the older and smaller 205, and that's from years ago. And it's even worse in here. The dashboard layout is logical enough, but it is terminally bland. At best, the 306 was only ever average in this department, and now it's allowed itself to be left well behind the opposition. Something which can't be said of the Astra Sport. Stung by the press criticism of the Astra last time, Vauxhall were determined not to get left behind by the opposition. So they brought in Lotus to hone the suspension and quell once and for all those rumours of soggy handling. And it worked. The steering really is much sharper. You can turn tightly into bends and revel in the kind of handling that briefly wrestled the crown of the Drivers' Championship from the 306. In short, it's a great driving experience and a fantastic driver's car. Unfortunately, the interior didn't take that same leap forward, although there is a definite improvement in quality over the previous Astras. The layout is simple and fuss-free, it's just a bit bland. The whole thing feels as if it hasn't been designed, but it's been assembled. I'm afraid it's straight to the back of the class for Vauxhall for some more lessons in style. And I'm afraid that those lessons in styling also need to be applied to the outside. The Astra looks solid. It's certainly never going to set the world alight or make heads turn to get a second look. This line that runs from the top of the headlights to the tail lights at the rear gives the car deep sides and creates a kind of chunky feeling. That's added to by the cut-off squared headlights at the front and the abrupt end to the rear. The whole look is solid and adventurous and very middle of the road. They'll sell millions. When it launched, the Astra took the 306's crown as the best handling car in its class, but Vauxhall must have been kicking themselves. There's been a revolution in the hatchback market, and a few weeks after the Astra came along, Ford swept them away with the Focus. The Ford Focus was launched to a huge media hype, and it did make quite an impact in what had become a very staid market. I know taste is a very subjective thing, but I think Ginny and I are going to have to disagree on this because I think the Ford Focus looks awful. The problems start at the front end. The headlight is just hacked in regardless. The sides of the car would have flowed reasonably well, except that the designers felt that they had to get out the stencil set and cut in a load of geometric shapes for no apparent reason. And then we get to the real problem area for the Focus. It's got a big, fat, well, rump is the politest way of putting it, above which are these tail lights. They're just cut in again. There's no regard for harmony whatsoever. I could never forgive this car for having this face. 
I'll take those, thank you very much. Well, Richard's got one thing right. I love the shape of the Focus. He misses the point completely. It's bold, it's original, it's different for heaven's sake. Richard will be telling me next that his favourite fashion designer is Marks & Spencers. I just wish that more car manufacturers would offer us something that breaks the mould once in a while. And my enjoyment of looking at this car is only increased when I open the door. At last, somebody has realised that we spend most of our times sitting inside a car looking at the interior. Just take a look at this wonderfully sculpted dash and those gorgeous geometric shapes that Richard was just too square to handle have been carried on from outside in here. And as usual, there's Ford's clever attention to detail that makes the driver's life so much easier. Love or loathe the focus, you could never accuse it of being bland. And once underway, the story simply gets better. In recent years, Ford have transformed their cars from rather lacklustre driving experiences into class leaders, and the focus is no exception. Even the bumpiest of road surfaces seem smooth, and it's guaranteed to entertain you no end on your favourite A roads. A clever multi link rear suspension helps to raise the game way above the competition. But driving pleasure apart, this is a practical car. It's easy to park and it's great fun for nipping around town in. It really is a class act. And for the sensible amongst you, the body of Ford's Focus is galvanised and it comes with a 12-year anti-corrosion warranty. In gear trim, but with the same 1.8-litre ZTEC engine, the Focus is comparable with the Astra 1.8 Sport and the 306 XS we have here today. In price and specification, they all come in at around about the £15,000 mark. Which you choose would depend on your priorities, on whether or not you fancy a little bit of flair in your life. Because for me, the focus is streets ahead. It looks fantastic and it's got twice as much style as the other two. Plus, it's the undisputed king when it comes to driving pleasure. Whereas for me, that new edge design is too reminiscent of the jelly mould of the Sierra era that's been the victim of a frenzied attack by <laughs> Edward Scissorhands. No, I'd have to have the more subdued Astra, even though it's probably so subdued I'd never be noticed at all. Yes, if you're not too bothered about being noticed, the Vauxhall Astra Sport is a huge improvement over the previous model, but it is never going to make you stand out in a crowd. For so long the best driver's car in the class, the opposition has caught up with the 306. It's still a good buy, but in present company, Peugeot's old stager falls back to the bottom of the pile. And whether you love or you loathe its looks, there can be no denying the impact the focus has made to the hatchback market. Dynamically, it leaps to the top of its class. The old Vauxhall Frontera was generally acknowledged to be a pile of old rubbish. It fell somewhere awkwardly between the lightweight off-roaders and the heavyweights in price, specification and capability. That makes it all the more surprising that Vauxhall took the decision to make the new Frontera closely resemble its somewhat useless predecessor. Having said that, it's still a pretty handsome car. This is the new long wheelbase, it's the V6 Limited, it's the top of the range, leather everywhere, and I'm going to get my muddy boots all over it. The new Frontera has been widely praised for the improvements to the ride on the road. And in this, the long wheelbase version, well, whilst a long wheelbase may bring penalties off the road, on the road, that goes even further to ironing out the choppiness that might be associated with the short wheelbase 4x4. That means it's actually quite a civilised place to be. Despite being so high up and all the advantages of a 4x4 for that commanding driving position, you could genuinely almost be in an ordinary family saloon. And that air of civilization is added to by the pretty high specification. This is a top spec version, but we've got electric and heated mirrors, heated seats to keep your body warm in winter, and pretty much every other gizmo you're going to want. The only thing lacking, and is lacking in every Vauxhall, is a sunroof, but then we do have air conditioning in here, so you can live without some luxuries. This that we're driving today is the V6 engine version, and it's a lovely engine. Very smooth, very powerful, very torquey, and it makes a great snarly noise. Mated in this instance to an automatic gearbox, four speed, very smooth, changes very nicely. You can get a five speed manual with the V6. Also available is a 2.2 litre engine, which obviously has to be worked a little harder, but is perfectly capable, and that's available with a manual gearbox. 
You can get into one of these for less than £19,000 with the smaller engine version and perhaps lose a few of the bells and whistles. Now that's Land Rover Freelander territory and to my mind this feels far more substantial both on and off the road. It has a greater presence. It's actually a bigger car. Sure, as a 4 before, it can't compete with the top dogs, the likes of the Toyota Amazon, but then they're up to twice the price. So you still do get what you pay for and in the case of the Frontera, I think, you get perhaps a little bit more. This is a 4 before vehicle. Throwing it through bends at enormous speed is never going to be a good idea, but with the V6 and with the 2.2, it's quite capable. There's more than enough power. It'll cruise very happily at uh, easily at motorway speeds. And through the corners, it's actually very controlled. It controls its substantial body weight very well. It doesn't move around too much. It's all held down really quite well. The suspension has been pretty well sorted. It may not be fair to hark on about the car's less than illustrious predecessors, but I'm going to do it anyway. And face it, the previous Frontera rattle shook and fell apart at the least provocation. Vox will say the new one won't, and looking at it, I think they're probably right. On the inside, it feels substantial and well put together, though not exactly interesting, it has to be said. The dash particularly is stupendously bland. Functional, no doubt, well laid out, no doubt, and probably not that rattly but bland, definitely. Where it does score big points is in the back. It's cavernous. It shames cars substantially larger. There's an enormous amount of leg space, even with the seats in the front set a fair way back. Headroom is certainly not in short supply, and overall you do feel not only high up, but for once, like there's plenty of space around you. If you're tired of climbing into 4 before the size of houses, only to find that inside there's as much room as a Wendy house, this is going to come as quite a refreshing change for you. Now the good news for space doesn't end there. At the back, this boot is enormous, and I mean cavernous. This split opening tailgate in a Range Rover style is very handy in the supermarket car parks. The bottom half swings out like that. And one reason there's so much space in the boot is that the spare wheel has very sensibly been put here rather than inside, taking up half your useful boot space. The new Frontera's off-road credentials seem fine. It has a proper selection between high and low on the four-wheel drive system and it can be remotely switched in and out of two- and four-wheel drive. There are two different modes for sport or for slippery conditions driving, all of which means it is pretty capable on the rough stuff. Where the Frontera starts to really make sense and win out against the opposition is when you bring the price into the equation. Bear in mind, this is the top spec, top of the range. It's the V6 Limited Long Wheelbase. That makes it a pretty special. As we've seen, it's pretty highly specified. And bear in mind that it feels as substantial as 4 before is effectively a class up as the real big boys of the 4 before world. And then look at the price. For this version, with an automatic gearbox, you're going to be looking at about £24,000. £1,000 less for the manual gearbox version. And that really is the kind of money you'd expect to pay for a lightweight 4x4 with a load of extra kit on. Not what you'd expect to pay for something that can compete with the big boys. That's when the Frontera really starts to win out. And well done to Vauxhall. It's also a car that doesn't mind getting its feet wet. Coming up after the break, Chris Goffey drives the Mazda 626 and Ian Royal ventures off-road in one of the biggest off-roaders around, the pickup, the Ford Ranger. Now most road test cars look immaculate and that's because the manufacturers have specially prepared perfect examples of the breed. If you look at this Mazda, you'll note there's more than a little road grime, squashed flies and bird droppings on it. And that's because when it arrived just before the weekend, on the spur of the moment, we went down to Dorset and back in it. So this car has covered considerably more miles than the usual trip round the block that a road test car gets at a motoring journalist's hands. Mazda 626, of course, 
interesting to me personally, 20 years ago I went to Japan for the launch of the Montrose, this car's forerunner. Mazda decided they'd had enough of letters and numbers. After all, they'd had the 1000, the 1300, the 323, the 616, the 818 and the 929, not to mention all the rotary engine cars, the RX1 right through to the RX7. But in fact, the name Montrose only lasted one model year, and then they went back to this 626. Now this is the new 626 Estate. So many Estate cars are simply an Estate rear end tacked rather uneasily over the space where the saloon car boot used to be. But this is a completely new and different body. They've added 65 millimetres to the wheelbase and 85 millimetres to the overall length and they've also added 85 millimetres to the height. Now that means you can comfortably sit higher in the vehicle than you did in the old car. Mazda say that uh, contributes to a lack of driver fatigue and certainly on our high speed run down to Dorset and back over the weekend, I can vouch for that. first place it's very easy to drive. All the controls are light and the switches are precise and they, they feel right, something the Japanese are so good at. Quite willing performance from the 2 litre engine, develops 136 brake horsepower, that's good for 0 to 60 in around 10 seconds and onto a maximum of 125 miles an hour so you're not going to be left behind by much. Road holding and uh, handling, nothing wrong with that, totally predictable. Nothing much to shout about though. It does get upset on uneven surfaces, but the ride overall is pretty good. And the power steering is rev sensitive, so it's very light at parking speeds and then stiffens up as the speed rises. And they've given the car big powerful brakes with good ABS. So there you have it, the Mazda 626 Estate. How do you sum it up? Well, it does everything pretty well. It's got excellent air conditioning, very good in-car entertainment, it rides and drives well, and it's quite quiet. Lots of capacity for an estate car. It's not as exciting and involving as the Mazda sports cars, the MX-5 or the RX-7, but then it's not intended to be. It's not as good as the top of the competition, but it's better than most, and at 18,000 quid, it's quite competitive. How would you sum it up? Worthy, but dull. In America, they just love them. No, I'm not talking about burgers, donuts or muffins. I'm talking about pickup trucks. Why Americans have this fascination with pickup trucks, I really just can't understand, to be honest. And you don't have to be a hillbilly redneck swilling bourbon to drive one. They've now become family vehicles with large cabs, luxury accommodation. And in the case of something like the Dodge Ram, a seriously fast beast that can outdrag most sports cars. So, it's interesting that Ford have decided to launch this, the new Ranger here in the UK. Now, apparently our lifestyles demand this sort of vehicle. It's going to be the next big trend. Does your lifestyle demand a pickup truck? No, and I'm not sure that mine does either. Perhaps it's more the case that Mitsubishi have the L200 introduced now in the UK and Toyota have the Hilux. But at the moment, the pickup truck market here in Britain is only worth 0.13% of total vehicles sold. So in other words, the market share is tiny for this sort of vehicle. Unlike this rather big beast, which is big in every way, apart from what's under the bonnet. Now you get a choice of two two and a half litre diesel engines. The first kicks out only 78 brake horsepower and is an indirect injection diesel. This second one is better. It produces 109 brake horsepower it's turbocharged and intercooled, it's the same two and a half litre engine. But let's face it, neither engine is going to produce really any sort of excitement. And you can imagine both of them struggling up a fairly large hill with a full payload and a trailer on the back.
So how does the Ranger cope out on the road? Well, you have to start by saying it's slow. It's unbelievably slow, in fact. I know 0 to 60 figure times don't really count for this sort of vehicle, but just to give you an example and to prove the point, I'll tell you anyway. The 60 mile per hour sprint in this 2.5 turbo diesel takes a snail's pace 26 seconds. But that's nothing compared to the non-turbo diesel engine, which would take you to 60 miles per hour in an astonishing 43 seconds. You could run faster, for goodness sake. It's amazing that in America, pickup trucks have wonderful, huge engines, superb acceleration. Here, they're tinny, they're hopeless, they're slow. There are three versions of the Ranger, a regular cab with seating for two and either two or four wheel drive, a super cab with two extra jump seats and two wheel drive, and this, the four door double cab, the family version if you like. It seats five, it has four wheel drive and the turbocharged engine plus lots of payload space. Ride wise in the Ranger, well, the suspension is very, very soft, which you really notice at most on country lanes on the motorway. It's fine. Uh, steering, a little light, a little vague, a lot of understeer. You go towards a corner, you start to turn, and nothing much seems to happen. So you turn and turn again until you get round. Acceleration through the gears, first and second, nothing much to talk about. But once you get into third and fourth gears, there's plenty of torque there. And it's very happy cruising on the motorway at 70 or so miles an hour, with still plenty to get you past slower traffic. Inside the cabin, it's really quite spacious, certainly thanks to this high roof line. Ford claim you can also seat five adults in comfort in this double cab version. Now, looking at those rear seats, I somehow doubt that. But anyway, that's what they claim. Specification is pretty high. The steering wheel is tilt and height adjustable. You get a radio cassette play. You get twin sun visors, no less, which obviously is a big selling point on pickup trucks. Other things in this double cab version you get as well, electric windows and air conditioning, bless them. Now, although Ford claim that this is the sort of vehicle that can be used to enhance our lifestyle, I can't honestly see it, can you? If you're a builder, a tradesman, something like that, you need that payload capacity at the back, absolutely fine. For the rest of us, just doesn't work for me, and certainly Mitsubishi's L200 looks better. Prices, well, they start at about £10,500 for the caffeine-free regular cab version, rising to about £15,000 for this caffeine-enhanced double cab version. Next week, a special programme brought to you from the 1999 Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders show at Millbrook. Steve Fowler from Montcar will be there to test some of the newest models on the market and we'll have the very latest news from the motoring industry. That's next week on Motor Week.